last Tuesday on our translation, the overall genetic message. So this is probably the part that's review for everybody. Uh, we've got the code section in the middle there. So let's go through this real quickly. What did triplet mean? Three in reference to? Okay, the number of nucleotides that code for a particular amino acid. So it's a triplet code. We need three nucleotides to get an individual amino acid. Non-overlapping. Yeah, when we look at our code, it doesn't go, it, best to look at a picture. Okay, our code doesn't overlap, meaning when we go yellow, blue, red, the next code sequence is the next uh, nucleotide, next set of three nucleotides over. Okay, so it doesn't duplicate on top of itself. Commolus. It's a continuous code, meaning there's no spaces in between each of the nucleotides. Okay. Continuous makes... Uh, no. So overlapping is what we're seeing up at the top image. And non-overlapping is what we're seeing here. But I could go through, if we look at the comma or the comma code or punctuated code, I can go three nucleotides, comma, next three nucleotides. That's not overlapping. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. So it's still a non-overlapping code, so we have to be a little bit more specific with what's happening in that secondary situation. So it's not exactly the same thing they so are why doing. why are some overlapping and some punctuated? They aren't. That's what they're saying. These are the possible options that we could look at within an individual code. Based on our observations, we found that it's a non-overlapping code and that we're looking at a continuous code or commaless. Okay. Okay. But those are the possible ways that we could have interpreted the code, and it turns out that those other ways didn't work. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, what they're showing there are the possible options. Because when we initially looked at this, what we had was just a sequence of nucleotides. How do we then go through and process and decide how that code works? So they ended up breaking it down into parts to see how it, how it was actually translated. Uh, degenerate? So we can have multiple sequences of nucleotide codes that code for the identical amino acid. Okay, so it's de degenerate because multiple codes code for the same amino acid. That's what we're saying by degenerate. Different codes, same thing. Yeah. Different code, same result. Okay. Right. Universal? Same code The same code for all life as we know it. There is, I think, a few exceptions that I wrote, that your textbook, I think, leaves a sentence on. Um, but I don't remember exactly what those were. So as far as we're concerned, all life as we know it, plants, uh, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, animals, all sorts of fun things, all run based off of the same code sequence. So if we have yellow, blue, pink coding for an arginine, every single form of life that has yellow, blue, pink as the code, codes for arginine. Okay. So that's kind of an impressive idea which would go back to kind of evolution ideas. We've got one source for all of our genetic information and everything followed that exact same code. So we do have kind of one central position where everything started. <clears throat> the overall uh, image that we're starting with is what's listed in the upper left-hand corner. So what we're gonna end up doing is taking each of those amino acids and we somehow have to match them to the code. So we have a carrier that allows the amino acid to interact with the proper code sequence. That's our tRNA molecule. So it will select both the code and the amino acid and effectively partner them so that we can get the proper sequencing. Uh, once we've got our activated amino acid that we can bring in, we're then going to have to somehow build the peptide chain. So we need some other kind of function to wrap around and read the code sequence and then bring in the proper amino acid tRNAs. Okay. So we're going to need something or some place on our mRNA for that enzyme to bind to allow for that propagation. That's our start codon or sh slash shine dalgarno sequence. Uh, they are different things, but they're both associated with our protein formation. We'll talk about those. And also, we apparently have some facotors. Um, those are our 
<laughs> initiation factors. This is what you get for apparently editing slides at 5 in the morning. Um, we've got initiation factors that are going to come in to help facilitate the start of our peptide sequence. So that's the initiation of our peptide chain. We're then going to have elongation factors, which are going to be slightly different because our initiation needs to get everything started. But then once it's started, we have to then continue that process along, which is going to be a slightly different role. We might predict that we have elongation factors. So now things that come in to help that peptide sequence grow. And then at the very end, we're going to have to somehow stop that whole sequence. Uh, and there's a variety of ways we could possibly come up with that. Okay, what are some ideas on how we could stop the peptide sequence. Road dependency. Uh, row dependency has to do with our transcription, not our translation. So we're now into translation. But you're right, and that's going to be one of the things you're going to have to remember is we've got to start an initiation, an elongation, and a termination in every single one of these steps. Okay, so we're going to have to be careful on trying to separate those away from each other. Uh, you, you, oh, it's uh, it's still going back to our translation and our replication. Okay. We're looking at a stop codon. There will be some potential signal within the mRNA that says stop processing, stop putting amino acids onto it. Okay. That is one method, and that's the method that was actually adopted by life. But what's another option? We could potentially have something come in to kick it off. I would kind of put us in that same kind of stop codon situation. I think there's an even easier one. You run out of mRNA. <laughs> you can't code any more amino acids if there's no mRNA left. <laughs> um, it turns out that we don't end up seeing that, that we're really looking for that stop codon. So there's a particular code that signals everything to fall apart. Okay. And how it signals it is where we're getting into this release factor issue. Isn't that like okay. AUG? Uh, Something like that. AUG, I'm pretty sure, was the start. Stop. AUG is the start, yeah. right? Like, What's the stop? You, There's three you stops, gone, right? You go away. You I, don't know. Know. I think they're in the sides. We'll yeah. look at them in just a second. <laughs> so that's kind of our overall picture. So what we want to go through and do is look at how translation works in both our prokaryotes and potentially our eukaryotes. Uh, translation, interestingly enough, at least as far as the textbook goes into it, uh, we seem to know a whole lot less in eukaryotes, and they just kind of say, oh, there's some extra things in it that we call slightly different names, and then we just kind of move on. <laughs> um, so that's actually kind of nice, because we're really only going to focus then primarily on our prokaryotes. <clears throat> so, what we need to start with is kind of how that, well, not quite there yet, but how they went through and discovered the code. There's a variety of different options. Uh, what they, uh, one of the experiments is they just created long mRNA chains with the exact same amino, or exact same nucleotide within that sequence. Okay. With that process, you're going to end up repeating the exact same amino acid off of that sequence. So they now have a way to understand, well, a sequence of A's is going to code for a particular amino acid. And they now have an idea or some idea of what the code is for that particular amino acid. So we could do the same thing with all of our um, nucleotides. So poly U gets you um, polyphenylalanine. So you can just see that sequence of amino acids coming off of it. After that, they might want to understand triplet versus doublet versus quartet, you know, how many uh, nucleotides are involved in the code. So then what they can go through and do is start to tweak their possible options. And instead of running the exact same nucleotide, they'll alternate. Okay? We can run AC, 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 AC. Okay? And what are we going to end up seeing as our possible options in that case? It's all going to depend on how it reads. If it reads as a triplet code, we see ACA followed by CAC. So we would start to see that we have a difference in that code. Okay? If we had a doublet code, we'd see AC followed by 
AC, AC, we'd get the exact same nucleotide put into the sequence. <laughs> da -da, da -da. I'm not even sure that's worth repeating for the recording. <laughs> Right. So what they can go through and do is based on what nucleotides they put in, they can start to predict or see what the result is and start to pair that back to what are the possible sequences or possible codes that we could have come up with. Right. So in this case, if we see two amino acids, we very well can't be doing uh, a doublet code. So the triplet code does potentially work. What about a quartet? Right. If we did AC, AC, it repeats. We get the same thing. So that wouldn't work. What if we just had one nucleotide? Well, we could look at a, a lack of affinity, but we could probably get away, get around that. But what if there's only one nucleotide? Is that even a possible code? Yeah. Why not? There's a lot more than four amino acids. There's only four nucleotides. We wouldn't be able to have enough consistent uh, translation through that process. Okay. Um, the other thing they went through and did was ran binding assays so that they can go through and they can start to tag different amino, uh, yeah, different amino acids and set them up with their partnering tRNAs. We may not know what the code is, but we can at least partner those. And then we run it through uh, a ribosome that just has a short sequence within it. Whichever one binds, okay, that's now stuck to the ribosome. And if we can then stick that ribosome to another piece of paper, we can then wash everything else off. We take a look at the paper and say, OK, what was it tagged with? Okay. That way we can say, oh, well, the code that we use has to pair for that amino acid. Okay which is a pretty tedious process considering we've got 64 possible options. Okay. But we had 20, 30 years, and that was probably four or five dissertations. Okay. So we paid some graduate student next to nothing to go through and find all that. Okay. <clears throat> so the code itself, I might pull this down a little bit. Actually, did we get them all on there? I think we did, actually. Okay. So we've got all of our possible combinations with our code. This is the code coming from which piece? The tRNA or the mRNA? M this is our mRNA. This is the actual code. So what's on the tRNA? The anti-code. Anti okay, it's partner. So what we're looking at as our five prime position, if we start with our first nucleotide being U, the second nucleotide can be U, and now we've got a list of all our possible options with our third nucleotide being U, C, A, or G. So they went through and partnered those. Within each of those sets, we can go through and then see where we get duplication within our code system and how it ends up propagating outwards, and we can see what each code codes for. And you'll notice that we do see that degeneracy. For instance, right up at the top, uh, a poly U code gets you phenylalanine, but if we had two U's, or two uracils and a cysteine, we still get phenylalanine. Okay. So our code is degenerate. It does kind of uh, overlap within the system. And then you'll notice that some nucleotides have a lot more options. Other kind of patterns, let's see, do I actually, I may have delisted the patterns. I did list, del delete some of those patterns. Uh, what you'll start to notice as well, that particularly if we take a look at uh, the second set there, our CU. Does it matter what the third base is? Nope. Doesn't seem to. We still get leucine in that case. Okay. So CU with any other nucleotide gets us leucine. Why might we do something like that? Because of the binding affinity. So that third nucleotide for sure increases the binding affinity. Yeah, it has to do with mutations. If there's a mutation and it happens to hit that third base, does it matter what happens? No. We're still going to code for the exact same amino acid, which in theory won't affect our protein. Other things that we can do is look within individual sections. For instance, uh, our UU code sequence, okay, or our second amino acid, if there's a mutation uh, at the first position, 
right? U versus C versus A versus G. So let's assume our U is fine and we don't care our second, sorry, our second nucleotide is U and that one's okay and our third one's a little wonky and the first one's a little wonky. Is that going to affect probably our protein structure? What's the difference between phenylalanine, leucine, oh crap, there's a lot of leucine, isoleucine, methionine, and valine? They're all hydrophobic proteins. So a mutation at either the first or the second position, or sorry, first or third, really doesn't change our structure by that much. We're still generating a hydrophobic amino acid going into it, so a mutation doesn't hurt the overall process. Will it change it? Absolutely. The question is how much does it change it? Okay. If we, instead of having that sequence, our valine, isoleucine, leucine, and our phenylalanine, if we threw in maybe arginine or glutamic acid within that coding sequence, that's now going to make a huge issue or a huge impact on our overall structure if our code is slightly defunct on one end or the other. Because now if that mutation shows up, instead of having a hydrophobic amino acid, I have an extremely hydrophilic inner, uh, amino acid, or one that's potentially acidic or basic. That can now have a huge impact on the overall structure. So what they ended up, or what we see within these, is that within each of these individual codes, we do kind of see a grouping of the amino acids within an individual code sequence. So our second nucleotide being uracil, we get roughly all hydrophobic interactions. Our second nucleotide being cysteine, what do we end up with? <coughs> Serine's hydrophilic <coughs> through the OH. Did I do that one right? I did that one right. Okay. Proline, hydrophobic. Threonine, hydrophobic. Alanine, hydrophobic. Serine is definitely kind of the outlier within that set, but it's not that big. It's not acidic or basic, so we're looking at still a relatively weak hydrophilic interaction. If we try the next sequence, tyrosine, histidine, uh, glutamine. Okay. We do have the stop codons in there, which could also mess with this. We'll talk about our stop codons as well. Arginine, our lysines. Okay. We have all of our polar, or a, a large section of our very, very polar uh, charged amino acids, all within a similar pattern. So again, if we make a change to that second nucleotide, it still doesn't result in a massive change to the overall uh, secondary or tertiary structure of our protein. Okay. So it's actually pretty impressive. I guess it depends on your point of view on origins of life. But if we started from uh, just kind of random motions, it's actually really impressive that we were able to effectively derive this code on its own, where if there were mutations, <coughs> it doesn't affect the overall result. We still get the same kind of uh, protein, the same kind of life, cell propagation, all of that fun stuff. Okay? So it's actually kind of neat. It's interesting enough that there have been several studies that have gone into it. And of all the possible sequences, again, your test book lists the exact details on it. But this particular pairing of our triplet codes and how it actually matches to the amino acids turns out to be one of the best 10 options out of the like million possible ways that we could have set up this code sequence. Okay. So that's astonishingly accurate and impressive to minimize mutations and to propagate life forward. Okay. <laughs> we won't get into that. <laughs> What we did talk about was that third base uh, didn't seem to matter all that much. Okay? And we had a little bit of flexibility there. That flexibility we've decided to call the wobble base. Uh, and what's happening within that pairing is that we get kind of a weaker interaction. Or sorry, not a weaker interaction, but it can change. Okay? It's kind of a variable uh, nucleotide. It doesn't bind quite as tightly. So we can put in some kind of random things at that wobble base position. Okay. If we look at the pairing that we're showing here, the wobble base shows up on which end of our mRNA? The three prime, but it shows up on which end of our tRNA? The five prime. Why? 
we're running anti-parallel when we go through to match these things up. Okay? So make sure that you keep that in mind when you look at these uh, pairings. Okay? That wobble base is one of the things that helps us out because we can end up uh, not causing mutations uh, when we go through and do these processes. The other thing that will show up within our wobble base is that we can get some imperfect hydrogen bonding interactions. Right? It shows up primarily within the wobble base position, but we can see it happen at other places as well. Okay, what do we mean by that? What pairs with G? These. Always? No. Turns out not. Sometimes it can pair up with U, okay, or uracil. Why would it pair up with uracil? We're looking at hydrogen bonding interactions, so as long as we have a few hydrogen bonding interactions, we can get that valid interaction between them, and it can actually maintain and, and propagate out that sequence, okay, or that amino acid coming off of it. So they've gone through and kind of tabulated that for you and shown that for individual uh, nucleotides, we can get different pairings, okay, which means if our tRNA has a G, that can pair with both our cysteine and uracil. If our tRNA comes in with a uracil, we can get both our adenine, which makes sense, and our guanine. Okay, what happens if we come in with an adenine? Interesting. It only bonds to uracil. We don't get a favorable hydrogen bonding interaction. What's I? Good question. What's I? Nope. It's another nucleotide, which I'm pretty sure it's on the next side slide. It's inosine. Okay. Uh, please say the structure was there. Yes, there it is. Where does inosine come from? <laughs> Where do we? So pyridine or, or pyrimidine or purine? Purine. Purine. What are our purines? adenine and guanine. Okay. So which does inosine look most like? It's an interesting Why? question, actually. Because of that yeah. We're probably looking at going up more like guanine, and somehow or another, we're, not, we're either not putting on the amine. This is another issue I have with this slide. We're not putting on the amine, uh, or it's been removed from the structure. <coughs> Okay, to generate that new nucleotide. Okay, so it's not one of our main nucleotides, but it does exist. Okay, that nucleotide is going to potentially change our interactions and allow for a little bit more flexibility again within our code because our code doesn't code for inosine. It codes for our adenine and guanine. So that inosine kind of fills the gap between both our adenine and guanine, okay, which means our inosine can end up bonding with both our cytosine because inosine looks kind of like guanine. It also looks kind of like adenine, so it can bond to uracil. Turns out its structure is different enough that it can interact directly with adenine as well, and that's what we're seeing within our hydrogen bonding system. Okay. Uh, so. You just blew my mind. Yeah. Blew Which part? <laughs> None of us knew what it is. Yeah, I didn't know what it was either. So what does it do? So it's just a new nucleotide, or a nucleotide that can get incorporated into the sequence based on post-transcriptional modifications of that particular amino acid. So that increase or decrease the right? Yes. Yep. So it's going to act as just a different nucleotide within that sequence. It has particular bonding patterns. Okay, so it's going to mirror... Uh, the interactions that we would expect out of guanine and adenine. So it'll code. Okay. So it'll code for our guanine or adenine. Okay. We'll primarily see that showing up in our wobble base position, which is the first uh, nucleotide in our anti-codon. Okay. And that's going to be our interaction back to our uh, codon within our mRNA. So we can see that kind of variation within it. It's the <laughs> Uh, why might we want this kind of imperfect pairing? What's the evolutionary reason behind this? Oh, well, shit, it's already up there. Okay, we can get away with less tRNAs because if we go all the way back to our initial code, 
Okay? Within each of those codes, uh, we have to have an anti-code on that matches that, okay? which means we would have to have 64 different types of tRNAs to do that matching. If we have a wobble base position where that third, uh, uh, third nucleotide isn't so critical to the overall code, we can get away with doing a little bit of flux in there, and we can use the same tRNA uh, with, that will still code for that same amino acid. Okay, so it allows a little bit of flexibility within the code, and we can be less strict on our uh, requirements for making more tRNAs. So there's less than 64 possible tRNAs, okay, which is kind of a nice thing. Uh, it also allows for a little bit more mutation stability in the overall sequencing as well. Okay. Uh, sidebar, I guess. What might be the issue that I have with this slide? <laughs> it is kind of annoying. What are they showing in between the nucleotides? Bond. Hydrogen bonding. To have a hydrogen bond, what do you need? You need a hydrogen. By definition, what is the point in organic chemistry? Any point that you see? Carbon. So what atom is this one? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I know. I'm pointing to it now. In our upper right-hand corner, what atom did I just highlight in my... Carbon. According to this drawing, it's a carbon. But if it's a carbon, can you have hydrogen bonding? No, what is that atom supposed to be? Hydrogen. <laughs> what is this atom supposed to be? Hydrogen. 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 Oh, those Hydrogen. Wait, those, oh, are okay. those are supposed to be hydrogens, not carbons. Okay. And they look like methyl groups. So then the question is, there is some methylation within these functional groups. Where is that methylation? Well, who the frick knows because they haven't labeled it appropriately. Okay. So what we're looking within these lines in between, focus on those being hydrogen bonding. If you see a little black line, that black line means it's going out to a hydrogen that is then hydrogen bonding with the other atom. So are the black circles, are those the methyl groups? Uh, those aren't methyl groups. What are those atoms? I have no idea. I can't see them. Yeah. I can't see it I wouldn't ask you if I knew. I can just see this on the whole circle. Well, <laughs> I figured you wouldn't know, but I figured maybe somebody else might recognize what those are. Where are they bound to? In all cases, a nitrogen, and that nitrogen is nitrogen number one within the nucleotide. What is that carbon? Uh, the, the first carbon of the sugar. of the sugar. Okay, which sugar is it in this case? Uh, ribose. ribose, because we're looking at our RNAs. Okay, our T and M RNA. So that's what those black circles are, and it does have a C in it. That if you look really closely, you can see that. Okay, it actually says C one, I believe. So that's where we bind to our sugars. Um, next issue I have with this slide. It smells funny. <laughs> it smells funny? Is that what you said? Yeah, when it smells stuff, it's basically all scratched up. It's too early to be drinking, right? <laughs> if we look at our partners, guanine can bind to what? Cytosine and uracil, right? So that's our wobble base pairing. That's where we would expect to see nice hydrogen bonding interactions. What do those hydrogen bonding interactions look like between guanine and cytosine and uracil? So those would be a good thing to show. What does it show guanine binding to? Adenine. Adenine. <laughs> Why? Because we can get a hydrogen bonding interaction. It just doesn't happen to be entirely relevant at all to what you're studying. <laughs> okay, so hydrogen bonding, <laughs> that's it, okay, so this slide is nice because some of the pairings they're showing are relevant towards your wobble base pairing, 
a lot of them aren't relevant. I tried to go through and start crossing them out, and I just got frustrated with trying to deal with it. So I stopped dealing with crossing it out. I, yeah. Or G with, didn't they show G with G too? No, they just did G with A. Okay. So they didn't even show all the possible hydrogen bonding interactions. They just kind of picked a random smattering. Some of them are relevant to what you would need to see for that hydrogen bonding interaction. Some of them aren't. Okay. <laughs> Procrastinated did it the night before. <laughs> okay. So please use this slide to understand what's going on with our hydrogen bonding. It's not necessarily what's happening with our wobble base pairing. Okay, I just want to make sure you're clear and understanding what's going on with that. That wobble base pairing is better shown. And this slide where we've got in the red box, your textbook also has a table that shows the same thing, but their table was massive and didn't fit, so I made a new one. Okay. Um, and we're going to go back to watching a movie. So that movie that we've been seeing, we've been seeing parts and pieces of it as we've gone through. We looked at transcription, we looked at, or sorry, we looked at replication within the video, then transcription, and now we can take a look at our translation. Just to get us, again, that same kind of overall picture. Whoops. So is this just because no one slept? Yeah, I've been awake since yesterday. When the RNA copy is complete, it snakes out into the outer part of the cell. Then, in a dazzling display of choreography. Take a seat. So, to go through and get our tRNAs actually activated to the point where they can function, uh, we, or sorry, our amino acids to come in to interact appropriately, we have to bond them to the tRNA. So there's an amino acid activation where we link the amino acid towards the tRNA. That tRNA can then transport your amino acid. Okay? So that process uh, pro is, has energy provided through ATP, and there's a few different enzymes that can go through and catalyze that. So there's two evolutionary paths within that. Uh, I'll just kind of circle it, and you can look at your s slides later probably to see that. We've got a class 1 uh, type of enzyme. So this is our class 1 over here. And we have a class 2 enzyme that's going the other branch. Okay. You'll notice if we continue to push out the arrows, which I can go through and highlight, we end up with the exact same product. Okay, so regardless of which enzyme we use, we still get the same uh, activated tRNA amino acid, which makes sense because if we generated two different types of tRNA amino acid sequences, it's going to be a lot more difficult to process later on because we'd have to have two different enzyme systems to match those two different enzyme systems. What's the difference between our class 1 and class 2? Uh-oh, only the people that are closest can figure this out. See. What's that one do? No. Okay. There's a lot of phosphorylation through this process. Okay. To start off, we're going to have our enzyme interact with ATP to pick up our amino acid. So that's going to start this whole process. At that point, we'll have our, phospho, our phosphate, our ribose, and adenosine or adenine attached to our amino acid, which is also known as, try again, there's only one phosphate, AMP for uh, monophosphate. Your tRNA, uh, oh, they're just repeating it. Uh, that new complex will come in with our tRNA, uh, what do they call it, a synthase. Your tRNA will have an active site where it wants to put the amino acid. At that active site, okay, so our tRNA is this weird squiggly thing down here. There's our tRNA. And what's attached to it is a phosphate with a ribose and an adenine. 
which means what's on our tRNA? AMP. <coughs> Why do we have all of that AMP? It's providing the energy to allow for putting the amino acid on in the appropriate positions. Okay? Within that ribose ring, we have two active alcohols on the ribose. What are those two positions referred to as? Nope. Nope. Two prime, three prime. Okay. Remember when we talked about DNA versus RNA? Okay. The big difference was uh, the ribose uh, with both alcohols on it versus deoxyribose, where we removed one of those alcohols. Okay. One of the reasons why it was important to remove it is if we take a look at our class 1 uh, tRNA synthetase, what ends up happening is we're using that 2' prime alcohol. That 2' prime alcohol will act as the nucleophile to interact with the carbonyl of our amino acid. That carbonyl has been activated by our AMP, which is now a really good leaving group. So our two prime alcohol can come in, attack our carbonyl, kick out the AMP leaving group, and we now have our amino acid fused to our tRNA. Problem with that is we've got it on the two prime position and we want it on the three prime position. So what happens? It shifts. We're going to run a transesterification reaction because we have an ester there already. So an enzyme will help facilitate the transesterification and slide the amino acid over to that three prime position. Okay. The class two has the three prime alcohol react instead of the, the two prime alcohol. So you don't have to do the shift. The end result in both cases is that we end up with our amino acid fused to the tRNA through the three prime position of a ribose uh, that has been attached to the tRNA through a phospho or a phosphodiester bond. Okay. Uh, this process actually provides an extra layer of fidelity within your translation uh, system because the enzyme goes through and selects both the tRNA and the amino acid. So there's an extra layer of selectivity within this. The enzyme has to recognize both the tRNA and the amino acid and pair them appropriately, okay, which means we have yet another system or another way to check everything. That enzyme is both going to check the amino acid and the tRNA. Anybody see any potential issues with this? How many enzymes are going to be involved in this process? probably going to see a lot more enzyme activity or a lot more different types of enzymes because we have to be selective for both the amino acid and the tRNA. Okay? And those structures will change. Within the tRNA structure itself, this will be relevant for the homework because your textbook only gives you this image but then doesn't talk about it. Okay? <laughs> so we've got our overall tRNA structure. Our anticodon is down here at the bottom within our pink loop. And that's where it'll code for particular amino acids. Okay. Other things to point out. So I guess we can highlight, go through. We've got our anticodon. I'm not going to write it again. I'm just going to circle it. We've got the anticodon. Other sections that are going to become particularly relevant is this D stem loop. Okay. And the other big one is your T psi C stem loop. What are those referring to? When do we have D? What nucleotide is D? We haven't talked about a D nucleotide. What it is is dihydrouridine. Okay. So what is it related to? Uracil. Okay. Very, very similar to the structure of uracil, except we've hydrated it. Di, or sorry, not hydrated it. We've added two hydrogens, dihydro. Where did we add those two hydrogens? Where does a molecule of H2 react? Uh, 
H2 and say platinum or palladium. That puts hydrogens on our alkenes. When we're looking at the dihydro, we're putting on extra hydrogens at that position. Okay. So our D nucleotide just happens to be a uracil uh, nucleotide that has been modified by putting on hydrogen, so getting rid of that double bond. Okay. That gets us uh, our dihydro. So within that loop, the dihydro Uridine changes the overall structure of the tRNA, and we end up with a special loop there. That loop is one of the things that uh, is triggered both within our, synth our synthase and in our uh, eventual ribosome. Okay. What's happening with the T psi C? What is T? No, we think thiamine, except... It's not. It's ribothiamine. What's the issue with thiamine? Is it bound into mRNA? No. Okay. Remember, that's why we had uracil. So what's happening with that T symbol is we're looking at ribothymidine. It's, again, a derivative of the uracil. Um, thymine and uracil are derivatives of each other anyway. But it's ribothymidine, meaning we're using a ribose to bind a thymine uh, nucleotide. Okay. So it is getting incorporated into mRNA. We are seeing... Uh, something similar to thiamine. The other one is our pseudouridine. Oh, crap. Uh, the pseudouridine, I forgot its structure, actually. Um, and lucky me, it's not talked about in your textbook. Uh, the pseudouridine, I'm pretty sure, is a methylation. Um, Shoot, but I can't remember where that methylation occurs. Um, crap. Did I write it down? That's where I was tempted to go, but I'm, I'm also suspicious it's happening off of your uh, two-prime alcohol. Um, regardless, all we're trying to get at here is with that T psi C, we're looking at T as your ribothymidine, the psi as your pseudouridine, so, again, we've changed the nucleotide sequence. That sequence happens to happen in a particular loop that is referred to as the T psi C, the C being cysteine. Cysteine? It is cysteine. Why do I want to say cytosine? What's cytosine? I think we got them backwards. Cytosine is C, isn't it? And cysteine is your amino acid? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So cytosine is your C. So what's happening there is we have that stem loop. Right? That loop is, again, one of the things that gets triggered within our enzyme. So when we look at an overall structure of tRNA, we need to be aware of where each of these pieces are. So we've got our T psi C, uh, kind of fun to say, stem loop, our D stem loop, and our anticodon section. One other important aspect to look at would be How about where we pick up the amino acid? The amino acid is up at your acceptor stem, and that's up at the top. Okay. Where's the five prime end? Shoot, I thought I included this on this slide because I knew I was going to forget it. I'm pretty sure our sequencing is three prime, five prime, but I might have that backwards. So we need to verify that. Okay. Huh? Um, why is that going to be important? Sapling asks a question about you labeling a tRNA structure on finding out where each of these sections are within the tRNA. Okay. So it's important enough that I figured we should include it in there because it's nice to know really where the codon is and where your uh, amino acid are located. Right, so that's the main reason I asked the question, but then it's got all those other pieces to it that you would need to answer. Okay. Well, it's a lot of stuff that you would have to memorize if I asked you to memorize it. If I just want you to do the homework and identify where those pieces are, it's not that big of a deal. Okay. <clears throat> Our chain initiation. So what we're looking at in this case, hmm, I wonder if I deleted it. 
This is for our prokaryotes. Okay. It is similar for our eukaryotes uh, as far as the overall uh, picture goes, but we do have some steps that are distinctly different. So to get this chain initiation process to happen, we're going to have to put together our ribosome. Okay. The ribosome has multiple pieces, which we did talk about. I don't even remember which chapter it was in, but we talked about that 30S and 50S ribosomal subunits. What were the S's again? It's the density. It's a density unit based on how far it spun down. Okay. We're going to need the initiation codon of our mRNA because right? that's where everything starts. If we don't have the initiation codon, we can't actually start this up. Okay. We'll need a bunch of initiation factors. Of course, we'll go through our alphabet soup. There you go with our IFs. So we've got initiation factor 1, 2, and 3 that are involved in this process. Uh, we'll need GTP as our source of energy to facilitate this. Oh, there's another nitrogen in it. So it's even more weird. Um, we'll also need magnesium. Magnesium is going to help fold the, the enzyme into the proper shape. All right. Uh, the one last thing that we'll mention is way up at the top of that list. We need tRNA FBent. What is that? That is the start of our sequence. So that is our tRNA, but what is that FBent? What if I had just done tRNA MET? What would that mean to you? It's methionine. The MET is the three-letter code for methionine. Okay, so if we look at tRNA MET, what we're saying is that that is the tRNA that binds methionine. If methionine was bound to it, we'd write MET, tRNA MET. So what is F MET? It's not an initiation factor. It is required for the initiation to go in um, prokaryotes. What F meant is, is formal methionine. Okay, the F is for a formal group, which changes its overall chemistry and prevents it from reacting off of one side of the amino acid. Okay, so it's used to start your amino acid sequence. What's interesting about that is what's the codon, our start codon? AUG. What is the codon for methionine? Also AUG. Okay, it's the same code sequence. So when it's the actual start codon, we need to incorporate FMET, not methionine. When the AUG shows up somewhere else in the sequence, we need methionine, not FMET. Okay, because remember, your FMET can't propagate out both ends because that formal group shuts down its activity. Okay, so how do we know that we should be incorporating FMET? But we said the initiation codon also codes for methionine, so that doesn't quite work. It's the very first one. How do we know it's the very first one? Well, there'll be a stop anywhere else in that sequence. But where is that initiation start? Your mRNA is going to be a long sequence. AUG is somewhere in that sequence that initiates your start. It's also somewhere in that sequence that gives you methionine. How do we know it's a start and not methionine? The yeah. first one? Nope. It has the N terminus, like the school not attached to something else? Uh, no. <laughs> How did we know when to start uh, transcription? When we started transcription, we needed the Tata box, our, up, our enhancers, all those things, so that something could come in and say, oh, this is where I need to start the transcription process. What do we need when we do our translation process? Effectively, the exact same thing. We need something for the ribosome to come in and say, oh, now it's time to actually start and process. It can't be just the start codon, AUG, because that also codes for methionine. It codes for two things. So we need something else within that mRNA sequence to say, hey, this is actually the start codon, not methionine. That extra sequence is the Schein-Dalgarno sequence. 
right? Once we have that shined Dalgarno sequence, everything can come in, start to bind, and what we'll get is our initiation complex. Okay. To start this whole process, let's see, did I stepwise it on the next side? No, I didn't. We'll come back to that. To start this whole process off, we'll start with, uh, I don't remember all the numbers, our IF1 and our IF3 within our 30S uh, ribosomal unit. That will pick up and bind our mRNA. Once the mRNA is bound, then our tRNA can come in, match up with the codons. We'll get our codon anti codon match. Uh, that tRNA is trans or brought into the sequence using IF2, so yet another initiation factor to help facilitate that. Once we've got that sequence set up, then our, what's it, 70S? 50S. Our 50S subunit can then come in, sandwich in on top, and now we've got our initiation complex. At that point, we can now move on to starting to bring in other, uh, other amino acids through new tRNAs to actually extend our chain longer. Okay? So to get our initiation to really, or to get this process started off, our 30S subunit has to bind uh, to our shine dalgarno sequence on our mRNA. Okay? That's one of our big starting pieces within this process. If that does not happen, we do not get the translation to occur. Uh, I'm actually surprised it's not on this slide. I wonder if it's on the next one. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So our initiation, we just talked about this with our AUG start codon. Uh, that it codes for both methionine and our formal methionine. What we'll do when we take a look at our formal methionine, if we go through and look at the amino acid backbone. Come on, Penn. Our amino acid backbone is right here. Okay. If we had just methionine, we have both the nucleophilic nitrogen and our electrophilic carbonyl uh, carbon. Okay. We're trying to initiate this process and make sure that it kind of stops and we now know exactly where it is. That's what our formal group is going to do. The formal group will bond to the nitrogen and shut that end off from being able to react uh, within the free flowing solution. Okay then we can go through and continue to add things into that electrophilic carbon. Okay, so that's the role of our FMET, okay, is to really start off that whole process. Okay. Deciding on what AUG to use is based off of our shine dalgarno sequence. The shine dalgarno sequence, oh, we've got the purine-rich segment. All I'm going to do is read it off with that particular sequence. Uh, that's one of the big signals saying, here's, our, here's the start codon. Without that shine dalgarno sequence, AUG is going to code for methionine, not formal methionine. So it's just looking for AUG with With that sequence uh, to come before it. Right. Right? And they're adding some extra information here, roughly 10 nucleotides before it. Okay. And it will be, I'm always bad with upstream, downstream. Upstream is before translation, right? So it will lie upstream of that sequence. Right. Questions on the initiation? The Oops, sorry. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. The shine dalgarno is a way to actually get onto the freeway. It's our merging lane. The chain elongation, of course, we're going to have uh, some new situations popping up in this. Um, let's see. This picture does it nicely. We'll talk about the picture a little bit first and then come back to it. If we look at our initiation complex, which is what we're starting with at the top, we've got our FMET, and you'll notice they've given us three little... Uh, what, F you? No, you have to. Oh. No. Uh, it's like it's like <sighs> okay. We've got three <laughs> binding sites within our ribosome. Those three binding sites pick up particular names. We've got E, P, and A. Okay, P is our central one, because it's not inherently obvious on this. Let's go through and add it up over the top. We've got our E site, our P site, and our A site. Okay. Our five prime end of our mRNA is over here, which means which way are we going to move to translate? Left or right? Good, you pointed the right direction. We're going to start coding out this direction, which means what's going to happen at that E site? 
It's our exit. It's where we're going to be kicking out tRNA molecules. In prokaryotes, there's a defined site where the tRNA actually sits temporarily before it's completely ejected. That's the E site. Okay. What's the P site? Protein works. It's officially going with our polypeptide. Okay. It's where our peptide chain is actually going to be extending out of the ribosome. So that was that little red thing that was pulling out. Okay. It's coming out of that position. What's our A site? That is our, it is effectively an entrance. There is a reason behind the A. What was the A? Amino acyl site. Okay. I don't, I guess they can't use entrance because they've already got exit. Okay. But what that's referring to is our tRNA is coming in as the amino acyl because our amino group is attached through an acyl functionality to our tRNA. So that's what they're referring to. So it's the new tRNA coming in, binding to the A site. Once that sequence is appropriate, we can then close the peptide or form the peptide bond between the uh, amino acid at the A site and our amino acid at the P site. Once that linkage has been formed, we then have to shift and kick everything uh, further on down the line. So we can push our, what was at our P site out to our exit site and what was at our A site into the peptide site. Okay? So we're doing that kind of translocation. And the strand is going to come out of the P site the whole time. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So like the exits, like in the video, the green part of the... And then the red part is where... The red part is where the, where the amino acid was located. The green part was the tRNA. So... Just imagine you're taking off like a stapler type. Okay, if anybody understands her, feel free to use that <laughs> analogy. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that it's bad. I, I just don't understand it. Um, so for this elongation process to work, we still need the 70S ribosome, which means we have to have formed our initiation complex. Uh, we're going to need the start co our, our codons for the mRNA, which if we have our 70S complex, we have the codons for our mRNA. Uh, we'll need the amino acyl tRNAs, which means we've put the amino acid onto the tRNA. It's become activated. And then we need uh, an assortment of factors. These are our elongation factors, which they like to abbreviate as EF. You'll notice they come up and refer to these as EF, and then instead of listing them out as 1, 2, 3, which was an awful method to begin with, they didn't pick much of a better method, and use uh, T, U, T, S, and G. What those are referring to have to do with very specific attributes of uh, when those things are primarily active. So your TU is temperature unstable, uh, TS is your temperature stable, and then uh, EFG is what's supplying your GTP. Actually, I like that one. That one makes sense to me. Um, the last thing that you'll need to go through and do this process is GTP and your magnesium. The magnesium is, again, remember to make sure that that thing stays properly folded. The GTP is going to be supplying energy, energy just like ATP would. So it's the same general idea. It occurs as it's coming out. No, the magnesium is actually part of the ribosome itself, oh, okay. that translation process. It's not part of the peptide that's okay. coming out. Uh, if we want the peptide to fold properly, we're going to have to need whatever right. it needs to fold properly, which could very well include metal ions. Okay. So if we kind of run through uh, the stepwise process, we've got our initiation complex. Our, our EF, why does that say P? Um, ah, <laughs> what the heck just happened? Oh, advance the next slide. Uh, our EFP actually binds between the A and P sites. Uh, they don't know the exact reasoning behind it, but they think what that's going to do is help catalyze the peptide bond. Okay? Our EF2 is what's going to pick up our tRNA and help transport it to, uh, accurately to the ribosome to actually get it to function or to get the tRNA matched in there. Okay? So we aren't looking at just free diffusion of our amino acyl tRNA. It's actually getting transported by another carrier to make sure it binds appropriately. If we get a mismatch, 
between the codon and our anticodon, the EF2 does not dissociate, and it ends up carrying the tRNA back out. Okay, so it, it, one of the things that helps guide and ensure that we get the proper amino acid sequence. So it's like a bouncer. <clears throat> sure. It's like a... It's like a bouncer that guides you to the bar and then says, no, you're not allowed in. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> in that process, once the peptide, or sorry, our amino acyl tRNA has been bound appropriately, that's when we'll eject uh, the EF2. Um, yeah. Kick that out, and in that process, it's ejected out with GTP. It then gets recycled back into its active state where it can pick up another amino, or another amino acyl tRNA using the EFTS. Uh, okay. So that's what facilitates that. At that point, we now have our amino acids appropriately aligned up based in the proper sequence. Okay. That's where our EFP potentially helps with that peptide bond formation. So we'll end up getting a peptide transfer. So our peptide, our P position tRNA, We'll dump its peptide onto our A site, and then we now have to do our translocation and shift our tRNAs uh, towards the left. Okay, so we can then move our peptidal tRNA to the exit site and move our amino acyl RNA that has the new peptide chain on it into the peptide site. That process, because again, we're looking at a motion, you're looking at more energy required to go through and push that, that's what's happening with our GTP, and uh, uh, our EFG is also involved in that process. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay. This process then gets repeated again and again and again uh, until we reach termination, which we will talk about on Tuesday, because we are definitely out of time. Okay. <clears throat>